Hey everybody, this is Jill from Autism Homeschool Mama, and I want to welcome you to the SPED Homeschool Conversations uh, podcast. This is a live podcast that we do every Tuesday on Facebook. And for those of you that are joining us uh, elsewhere, we also post this afterwards. We post it on uh, Facebook after the fact. We also do it on YouTube, so you can watch the full video, or you can also grab it as a podcast on iTunes. And tonight, our very special and very patient and wonderful guest is Kelly from um, Kelly Carter from Speak Easy Therapy Center in Las Vegas. And we had some technology glitches earlier this week when we tried, because it is Friday, not Tuesday, but we really appreciate her patience. I'm going to add her here so you can see her. And so Kelly, if you can go ahead and uh, she's going to help us to learn more about how we can help our picky eater. And that's something that I know that a lot of us deal with because it can kind of work its way into our lives um, as our diagnoses uh, affect the way that our kids eat and their diets. So, Kelly, if you could start off by telling us more about you and about your practice, that would be great. Sure. So my name is Kelly Carter and I own Speakeasy Therapy in Las Vegas and I'm opening in Henderson as well. I've been a therapist for over 20 years. I've kind of done a little bit of everything, but my heart is in peds for the most part. So I opened Speakeasy three years ago, um, just me thinking I would never have staff or anything, and it just kind of exploded. So um, the last 10 years and then the three years with you know Speakeasy, I've been focusing on like the oral structure and airway and breathing and how everything works together and the physiological aspects of feeding and um, the cognition and everything, how it all kind of um, intermingles. So a um, lot to learn. <laughs> yeah. 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 Forever learning. All right. That's awesome. Okay. So um, let's see, we have some questions. Um, I have some questions for you and also one that a viewer wrote in for you as well. Um, what are some of the most common problems that you see with picky, like picky eaters? I'm just gonna say picky eaters because I know it's not only uh, like that. It's a phrase, but <laughs> so what are the some of the common problems that you see? So with infants, um, it's when they're too stressed, um, they're having a hard time feeding, and so they're not gaining weight, and they can gag and vomit, and they're not drinking from an open cup because of oral motor weakness. Um, and uh, they're having a hard time transitioning from maybe um, purees to a solid food. So that's one form of a problem that we're trying to work with, with um, oral motor strength and, and stuff like that. Um, with toddlers, it's sometimes that they won't sit still, they're throwing their food, um, they're not growing because they are picky. Um, some of it's physiological, so if they have a weak core, then they can't work those fine motor aspects, which our feeding and chewing is that, and oral motor is actually another fine motor task. So if they don't have a good core strength, they don't have good fine motor. Um, and then sometimes it's a behavior where it's like at school they will, but at home they won't. So working through parents and teaching them how to do that stuff. Um, a lot of those kids go to those white food type diets where it's pancakes and chicken nuggets <laughs> and French fries. And so trying to help them get out, of that, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. get out of that pattern. And then right. uh, preschool, it could be a sensory issue. So it could be too much going on in a cafeteria or school age. Like this, it's sensory overload. So they can't focus because they're oversensitive to what's going on around them, as well as the gag, um, food allergies, um, and those kinds of things. So lots, um, of, lots of different things. <laughs> yes. I mean, and that's, yeah. and even with, even with saying picky eating, there's so many different variations as to right. why. Yeah, yeah. It's not like a one quick answer. And it's not always a choice, really, either. So, right. right. So you have to be kind of a detective, don't you? Yes. Figuring it out, yeah. So you mentioned uh, the fine motor skills and gross motor skills. It, it, I think I remember hearing, is it right, gross motor skills come first, right? Before, or is it? Is... So gross motor is like walking, sitting, standing. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have the core strength to sit on your own, you can't mm -hmm. feed a baby the next okay. the food because if they can't sit, then they are then they can't like go from here out and be able to use mm -hmm. their hands or have their neck and head appropriately hold, holding holding so that they can't eat that next phase of foods because their body is not physically ready for it. So that's their foundation, right? Gotcha. Okay. So what are some things that may be causing kids to be picker, picky eaters? Those, some of those are kind of the same 
thing, but are, are there like different disorders or things that you would say lend to that? Yes, yeah, so there's like EOE, which is the um, encephalic encephalitis, where the white blood cells line the esophagus and actually get inflamed. And wow. so that can cause um, signs and symptoms of feeding issue issues, and they can vomit, abdominal pain, they have ref but see reflux meds don't work because it's not reflux, it's actually um, a white blood cell attack. And so there's wow. they can do to figure that out and not, it's not common, but it does happen. Mm -hmm. Um, food allergies. So a lot of um, a lot of doctors will test for food allergies, but it comes out mm -hmm. clear because it's not um, an attack. Allergy, of a, right? Yeah, it's a sensitivity, yeah. and so mm -hmm. then that can affect them. But it doesn't look like an allergy. Yeah. Um, and then there, you know, obviously the diagnoses of mental retardation and autism and all those kinds of things usually play into picky eating. And that's more sensory processing related. A lot of those mm -hmm. um, kids yeah. with those diagnoses. Um, and then oral motor weakness. So if they can't manipulate the food with their tongue, then, they, then they'll refuse foods or um, not want to move forward because in their, their body's afraid of, of not being able to handle it. So it'll mm -hmm. appear like they're being obstinate and not wanting to do it, but they might not have the oral motor capacity to yeah. do it and so their body is saying no but um, they don't always have the words to, <laughs> right. to say that yeah yeah right so um also tongue tie um kids mm -hmm. with tongue tie food can actually cause pain because they don't have the lateralization to move the food mm -hmm. and brushing their teeth um if they have a lip tie or a tongue tie it can actually be painful because the tie, the tie is so tight I never heard of that other than like breastfeeding that affecting anything. So that's really interesting to hear. Wow. Yeah. So if there's a tongue tie, depending on where it is, they may not be able to put their tongue to into between their gums and their cheeks to clear out uh, food that's oh, there uh -huh. or move the food back and forth because if it's in the front, but you don't have if if it's tied, they don't mm -hmm. have the range to move back. the move the food back. So that's they amazing. won't eat certain foods because they their their tongue can't lateralize it back and forth or move it front to back easily. So they just tend to do more of those pouchy type soft foods because they're easier to manage. Um, and then there's airway constriction. So if the tonsils are too enlarged, the food is painful to go through. And so kids won't eat certain kinds of foods because the tonsils are impeding the airway. So yeah. it'll appear like they're picky, but really it's because they can't, painful. it hurts, it's painful. Mm -hmm. Um, geographic tongue is a tongue, is, your tongue has like patches on it. And when that happens on certain kids, um, it can, acidic foods can be painful to them and the tongue and things move around. So it's not always there, but if a kid has that, that can cause, um, issues with it. And then, um, yeah, the physiological aspect. So if there's, they have constipation and they have reflux, um, it's going to make them not want to try new things because they're afraid of mm -hmm. what their bot, how their body is going to react after. Yeah, when so they're that young too, depending on their age or how they're going to put that in words. My, uh, I'm lactose intolerant, and I have other. Um, I'm actually allergic to all fruit and <laughs> some chocolates. I have a lot of food sensitivities. But um, when I was a baby, I was lactose intolerant, and my mom thought people grew out of it. Um, so I never wanted milk or milk products or dairy products growing up, and. My parents were always thinking I was just being picky. <laughs> and we went to the doctor and the same thing. They were like, well, there's no way to test for it, but you're probably lactose intolerant. And we went home and told my mom and she was like, oh, well, you were when you were a baby. <laughs> so, so yeah, there's, you don't have those words. You just, your body knows. Like I wouldn't have ever thought to think like it makes me sick at that age. I was nine even, and I, I didn't make that connection, but that's pretty amazing. Got to listen to the body. <laughs> Well, yeah, and now they have blood tests. It's, there's one called the E95 food panel. So it tests like oh. 95 of the most common foods and it's blood, mm -hmm. the blood test. So they can test the blood and then they have it sit for a couple of days and then they go back and test it. So it shows how your body reacts over time to certain foods oh. versus like that anaphylaxis type thing, which is what most allergy shots are or allergy tests are, mm -hmm. is does your body go into anaphylaxis? Immediate. Not, yeah. How does your body do, like deal with things over time? Oh, so, so is that a newer, like a newer development then? Well, it's, I learned about it this last year because I've had issues my entire life and, and mm -hmm. everyone always said, you're fine. And it's like, no, I'm not fine. I know. So, <laughs> yeah. So when I, I found out about it. this, now I'm telling other people about this test and they're saying, yeah, 
it makes sense. All these times I've had all these issues and, but that, you know, an allergy doctor or a GI doctor won't run that panel. They just mm -hmm. run the allergy panel. So, so is that something you would use to test for like gluten intolerance or yes. sensitivities? Okay. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. I need to find out more about that. <laughs> so speaking of stuff like that, um, what are some ways that you can help or a parent can help with each of these problems, whether it's reaching out to certain professionals or things that they can try first at home? Do you have any suggestions? Yeah. So um, a big thing is it to, is to not make food or mealtime something that's a negative experience. Mm -hmm. So trying to keep it as positive as possible, not punishing your kid if they're not eating certain foods, because there's a reason. Yes. So you have to figure out why not not punishing them for not doing it um, and celebrating what they did do right. Um, you know, they say the studies show like eight to 15 times you would have to be exposed to something new before your body's more willing to at least accept it. So having little portions, like little teeny teaspoon, por tablespoon portions on a plate so that they're seeing the food, maybe they'll smell it, but they don't have to taste it. You know, eventually it, there's like a process with, in therapy where it's like, you see it, you smell it, you lick it, you bite it and spit it out. You know, there's a process. So kids learn that um, they have control over this situation and um it's all it's all about good you know good job trying it um and it but figuring out the why is a big part of like why won't they is it a right. sensory issue is it a is it just are they just having a food jag where they won't they're just stuck in this pattern and they won't grow out of that pattern um until they're guided um is it a control issue because um it's something they can control is it a health issue is it an oral motor issue? Like there's a lot of things instead of just saying they're a picky eater. It's like, right. why? Because yeah. every yeah. kid's a picky eater at some point. It's just, mm -hmm. they eventually, if, but you have to guide them out of that. You can't say, well, they don't like that. And so, and a big part of it too is a lot of parents will come into me and say, well, my kid doesn't like this and doesn't like that and doesn't eat this in front of the kid. And that's just telling in the kids in the kids mind. Oh, yeah, I don't like that. And I don't like that. So I always tell my parents, don't go around announcing what they don't like. <laughs> yeah, I always yeah. I say, tell me what they do like. like. And then if there's things they don't like, then say it in a different way um, and talk and then try to make it be like um, more of an adventure with eating, not a like a demand in a way. Or have them choose if there's two new items, which one would you be open to smelling or licking or tasting and not like you have to eat this or you can't leave the table? Because there are kids yeah. that they that will sit at the table and not eat and starve themselves because they can't do it. And sometimes their bodies don't even realize they're starving themselves because that's just a health issue that they can't get out of either. So there's so many reasons why something could be happening. So parents have to be the detective and figure out why. You have to try a lot of new things, I guess would be <laughs> helpful. But my youngest, he's, he's very, um, I, I suspect he has oppositional defiance disorder, but everything that's not a choice for him is, you know, uh, like he will shoot his own foot off as long as it's it's his choice. <laughs> and then right. it's not, you know, go, it's going against you. So I noticed like with him, I'll, if I'll just say, you know, re reframe it as like a, a choice that he has to make and it's up to him, then all of a sudden he'll choose exactly what I would have told him to do. So our whole life is reframing <laughs> to choices. But what are some ways then that a parent can say, you know, can express the foods that their kid doesn't like without reinforcing that idea for them? Well, usually when they'll tell me things they do eat, mm -hmm. then I can I can kind of figure out what they're not eating. And yeah. so then I'll, I'll, or I'll say, what kinds of vegetables do they eat? Instead of, mm -hmm. you know, they don't eat this broccoli, they don't eat cauliflower. So it's like, what kinds of vegetables do they eat? And they might, they might, right, instead of what they don't eat or what kinds of fruit do they eat or, um, you know, kind of trying to reframe it in their heads. And because a lot of times if the, the kid will just play that, you know, in their head too. So it's trying yeah. to get them out of that. Um, and then, like I said, even rewarding just them smelling it. And that's all they have to do. It's it's taking the pressure off the kid so that the kids, a lot of times I've noticed it's the psychological aspect of the parents watching them like, please, yeah. please. <laughs> and the kid feels that. And no, so it if you don't eat it. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. it's like, yeah, to get it's it. stressful. Yeah. I mean, and I know that there are kids, I have kids that come in that eat two things and it's just yeah. helping the parents 
try to like take a breath and you know we'll get there and then you know the process just, right i mean and sometimes there is the contingency so it's not a bribe but it's a contingency mm -hmm. like you take a bite and while you're while you're taking it like while you're chewing it you can pick a train track and then eventually a train track's built or you take two bites you get two legos and then they build something or whatever it is that because obviously no one wants games at their table all the time but to kind of get everything started sometimes you have to do so you're getting their mind off the fact that they're trying something new but more about what they want to do which is the game and so yeah, kind yeah. of like getting that reciprocity and the contingency without making it um like you have to do this or you're sitting here till you're it's done or whatever because then the kids feeling that and then not feeling that oh well i'm gonna do motivating. this yeah, you just want to motivate them. So I'll tell parents, pick out a couple things that they only get when it's this new trial time or this new time that, and then that goes up. And then if they don't want to try new foods, that's fine. And then that just goes aside. And then when they're ready and trying new foods could be, they lick it. That's all, yeah. I mean, just yeah. something. Um, and then eventually going from there and kind of building on that. Um, so these are just some things that I've, and a lot of my parents have said that that's helped um, kids be willing to, because it's yeah, not the yeah. demand and kind of giving them permission to go at their pace, but, mm -hmm. but reason, reasonable, obviously. You know? Yeah. <laughs> not so. giving them like chocolate for every bite or, <laughs> yes. Right. I mean, just yeah. So that. sometimes we'll break like a little, one of those little cookies into four bites, yeah. you know, and yeah. like, you know, just so that they're, they're seeing that they're getting something positive from it, not a yeah, negative yeah. reaction, yeah, but building the on the positive. Process. That's awesome. I think, yeah, I think um, if I had to guess, you know, I think a lot of people get really panicky. I think, you know, like the stress thing, you know, I, you know, puts you in that, that flight or fight part, you know, where you're just, you know, so you got your kid in there and I feel like then the parent is also like here too, <laughs> you know, stressing out and, you just got to take that time. I think a lot of people do kind of want like an answer right away. And, you know, but I think um, just, I think a lot of people get really stressed about food things, thinking my kid is going to very quickly be unhealthy. My kid is very going to very quickly lose too much weight. Uh, but I think it probably, you know, you, you definitely have some wiggle room, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, and, you know, um, I, I, like I said, I think a lot of it, the parents, the kid feels the parent's anxiety or anger mm -hmm. about it. And so it's yeah. trying to find a way to say, you know, it's going to be okay. And trying to find a pattern to make it so that the kids making having successes, and then they'll be more willing to try more things. Um, On the road. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there was a little girl that came in that hadn't eaten in four days and, um, oh, wow. and the parent, and then like, I'd see the parent and the parents like, <gasps> you know, and I'm yeah. like, <laughs> breath, you know, and like, let's just yeah. try. And so, and then she did because the, the, you know, it wasn't that like, oh, you know, feeling, um, mm -hmm. she was more willing to work and try and get that reciprocity going, you know, mm -hmm. and sometimes they'll do better in therapy than at home because at home they have, um, it, the environment's the same or whereas mm -hmm. here it's different. So sometimes yeah. I'll say go somewhere different in your house or go outside to have a picnic or go somewhere that's not where you normally sit, where you've had all the issues, go somewhere else. So it's new and it's different. Yeah. And then you can create a more positive, fun environment that way. And then don't worry about the dinner table, forcing them to eat right there. It can be there so they can see it and maybe smell it, but don't make that time where every, all the families there be this like six, like this struggle, have it yeah, be a yeah. different time in a different location or, whatever, just, just in the beginning, just so that the child can see that it's not like, oh, great, now I'm at the table and I know how it's going to be and everyone's going to be mad and I'm going to be like, you know, it's just taking that off the kid so that they can um, and just enjoy the experience of being together and then yeah. using a different time to like try new foods more on like a contingency type plan. Does that make so sense? Having that yeah, so having that change kind of helps them build like a new pathway in their brain, right? Because they're not just going straight to the old one where they're just going to slip right down it, right? Like having change kind of is, makes it a new experience. So it's easier right. to so have a new right. ending. Yeah. Right. So, so if you go, now you're sitting on, you know, outside and they pick on a picnic and, and, and the child. 
yeah, the child well, yeah. the child sees that it's not this stress environment, then eventually yeah. you take that to the table, right? Mm-hmm. And then the table's not stressful because it's not like, but you have to eat this right now. Like, mm-hmm. so if the child sees that, the child will feel that and be more willing to, well, it wasn't pressure there and it's not really pressure here. And so they'll be more willing to take the step further at the table. Yeah. But family time, dinner time needs to be like about being together, not about like you have to eat this meal. It's about being that social. Time. Right. Yeah. So, building trust. Like, <laughs> yeah. So you have to take that time a little bit differently in the beginning until if they can kind of mold it and meld it together. So you could be at the table trying new foods without that pressure because they realize that it's okay and it's not, you're not, they're not going to be mad, you know, yeah. if you're not um, they're they're in trouble. Right. Yeah. Right. That's a lot of stress. So it's just kind of working, working that that way. Yeah. Um, so, um, <laughs> I mean, and other things like you might have to do a distraction with the new foods um, in the beginning, but not forever. Or you might have right. to have a toy in the beginning, but not forever. Right. And then you or phase like, them out. You have it for a bite. Now it's every three bites or right. Right, things like that. Yeah. Just find ways right. to phase or it out. Need- you, if you take one bite, then you get a star. And after five stars, you can, you know, whatever that looks like. Right. But giving your kid, the, giving the kid the control and giving him a choice will empower them to want to earn that, you know, whatever um, time or show or toy. It'll give them like they have the control. It's not being told what they have to do. Yeah. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but does that also lend to them not feeling like, I eat broccoli because I have to eat broccoli versus being like, oh, I like broccoli, right? If it's more of a choice, then it, for them, it'll feel more like I like broccoli, right? Right. Down the road, you know, because <laughs> they they have that control and they're choosing, if you're like, yeah. Right. And there's things that my kids will eat that they don't love, but they'll eat it because that's what we're, that's what we're serving. So it might be right. that he might not even like broccoli in two yeah. years. He'll eat it but it's a or choice. a little bit yeah. of it because that's what's for dinner. But in the beginning... Yeah. It's more about just getting them used to being around it and touching it, smelling it and tasting it and, you know, just getting exposure to it and realizing, okay, nothing happened, you know, and then um, having them distracted while they're biting into it so that they're not focused on what is it doing in my mouth and how do I feel about it? But they're focused on, okay, which game piece am I going to, or I'm going to roll. So I usually say like, roll the dice and while you're chewing, like move your, you know, move your piece that many pieces. So they're focused on the game, Counting, not, yeah. <laughs> not chewing, you know what I mean? Yeah. So it's about a distraction. So they realize, and then when they either it didn't know, kill them or swallow <laughs> it, right, then they're like, yeah. oh, it actually was okay. I mean, yeah. I don't know that I loved it, but I, I did okay. And now yeah. I get a reward for trying so it. Bad. Yeah. Right. So, so- that that we talked about is kind of one one way I guess with um, helping. What are some um, myth and conceptions? I I don't want to cut you off. I'm sorry, but if you have any other suggestions, I'd love to hear that. And if not, um, what are some myths or misconceptions about picky eaters? So um, okay, so I mean, there's so many different tech. It's like the, I could talk a long time about all the different <laughs> ideas and things. So yeah, some of the myths are to say. Um, like the neophobia where a kid will not um, will not try new foods. And so mm-hmm. some parents will say, well, they didn't like it, so I just never gave it to them again. And so then these kids learn to li- be very strict with what they'll eat and very rigid because they're not getting the constant exposure because the parents have said, well, they didn't like it, so I just never gave it to them again. And so those yeah. the parents need to give them exposure to new foods, whether they liked them or not. So that they know that that's just around and eventually they may actually like them um, if you can, if they can get out of their own head, you yeah. know, so like sometimes I'll say to the kids, um, cause they'll say like, well, I didn't like that. And it's like, well, did you ever try it? Well, no. Well, how do you know you didn't like it? You didn't try it or you tried it two years ago and now you have a, you know, your mouth is more grown up and your brain's more grown up, you know, let's give it a chance, you know, just kind of, working with it like that versus like yeah. this rigidity of I'm only going to eat this or nothing that's green or whatever, because they haven't had the constant exposure to new things. Um, another one is, I, have to, I like so many things written down. Um, the, 
like the fight or flight, like to say, um, like you have to finish everything or you can't, um, or, or it's like this negative experience. So kids shut down at the table. And so not to make it be where you can't have, um, it's like you're kind of stuck in this negative environment at the table because the parents that say like, you have to eat all your food before you can go. Then the kids goes into like, Oh my gosh, that's, that's so much. Cause I don't even want that. So trying not to make that, which again is about the positive experience. Um, when parents say don't play with your food, um, that's actually, we want them to play with their food um, in the beginning because um, it's a way for kids to get exposure to it by, by touching it and smelling it and playing with it. And then at least they're exploring because a lot of times ex exploration needs to leads to trial. Yeah. So um, to say they can't touch it, like they need that tactile support sometimes and the tactile introduction to it so that yeah. they'll be willing to try it. Um, and then I kind of mentioned the whole um, they'll eat when they're hungry um, a lot. Some kids won't and they're medically like they just don't get hungry and their bodies don't signal that they're hungry. So to say um, like, you know, um, they'll eat when they're ready, it may not be that way. Um, yeah. So you have to find another way to um, to get them to eat without it being like a, this rigidity of you have to eat the broccoli or like that's your only choice because it's just going to make them like shut down um, and then they're going to feel that resistance and they're going to it's just going to get worse from there. Um, An oral like so don't talk with your mouth full. A lot of oh. times kids kids get so much food in their mouth because they have weaknesses in their mouth or sense sensory issues. So they yeah. might be like hyposensitive. So they don't even know they need all that food there so they can know where the food is. Yeah. Um, or they don't know how to manage chewing and swallowing of it. So that like they're stuffing their mouths and that's like, usually there's a reason why they're stuffing their mouths. So um, obviously we don't want them to talk with their mouth full because they can choke. But like sometimes there's a reason why. Mm -hmm. um, and then, um, yeah, just realizing that there's usually more than one reason of why they're being picky. So trying to figure out yeah. what those are and not just say they're being um, they're being difficult or they're being stubborn. It's like, well, why? Like what is that? They can't make improvements either. Because I know I see that. I see parents either being like, well, they're just being picky. Or I also see people saying, well, because of this disability, there's just no room for, for growth. And that's not a, it, neither of those are really like always the case, right? No, yeah, nothing yeah. is ever black and white. Yeah. yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So maybe you can debunk a thing for me because you mentioned the food thing, um, talking with your mouth open, reminded me, I remember reading somewhere, so I don't know, like that's one of those things I read somewhere, um, but that actually naturally we do kind of chew with our mouth open, is that right? And that we just, is, is that more of a cultural thing, chewing with your mouth closed or no? Can no, you debunk that? We don't, yeah, we don't want to chew with our mouth okay. open because oh, okay. we're swallowing air and then oh, air okay. can cause Gassy. gas and burping. Um, mm -hmm. And also when you breathe in, if your mouth is open and you breathe in, air or aspiration. can fall in. You yeah. Know, yeah, you can aspirate. Um, so if you're breathing, if you're chewing, if you have to eat with your mouth open, it's because you're probably because your airway is constricted. Okay. So if you can't breathe well through your nose and you have to breathe with your mouth open, then that's a, probably an airway issue that needs oh. to be addressed. Wow. There's so many different things. There's way more than I even realized. <laughs> that's amazing. Um, so then were there any other um, mis mis or con misconceptions you wanted to share about or is that cover um, them all? No, I mean, that's all I can think of at the moment. I mean, um, like I said, there's... I have, there's pages and pages of stuff that I could yeah. talk about. So it's kind of right. like, it's What's so hard to touch on one thing. Yeah. Yeah. I feel it's that like, way. Sometimes when people ask me something, I'm like, well, how long do you have? <laughs> right. Yeah. Especially when it's like your passion and your life's work. There's just so much, right? <laughs> well, right. Um, I want people to know that there's more, it's more, it's yeah. more, it's not so simple. It's you not know? black and white. Yeah. There's lots of, and, and then too, if you think about it, I'm sure a lot of kids have layers of things. 
you, you know, the comorbid disorders and all that. Like, you know, like with my son, he's got sensory. Uh, my youngest son, my oldest is on the spectrum. My youngest um, definitely for sure has sensory processing problems big time. Um, I don't think he's on the spectrum, but he's the one that I think also has ODD. Like he's real kind of, you know, so like he's got layers of things where it's like, is it because of the feeling of the food? Is it the control issue? Like there's definitely layers I think makes it even more complicated, which is nice to have people like you around to help figure it out. Cause I know that we are somewhat clueless sometimes <laughs> just like hopeless or, you know, grasping for help. <laughs> so it's nice to have people that know. Yeah. And he might need more like some sensory work before he sits down to eat, whether it's oh, swinging okay. or like, input. um, like the blankets or different kind of input before he sits down to eat. Cause then his body can relax into the eating experience. If he's had the sensory input he needed before, sitting down yeah, right. otherwise if his body's needing something and not and hasn't yeah. gotten it yet and then you stick him at the table then that yeah. it's going to be harder for his body to to like get into that experience because his body's still getting or not getting what it needed it's not ready for meal time basically, right basically right right okay right. <laughs> i'm understanding that yeah, yeah. So um, do you have any advice? This is um, one that somebody did ask me about was whether or not you have any advice for, and I think that it might kind of tie into what you first, um, what you first were saying about the not um, saying my kid doesn't eat, but, but if you have a kid who won't eat uh, because other people around them won't eat and they kind of like, you know, like I'm guessing, I don't know if it's a social thing, but like, how do you handle that? Or what do you do? Like, do you have any advice for parents that are, struggling with kids who are limiting their diets because of like siblings or, or do you think that maybe that that's um, like a misunderstanding on their part? Like any wisdom you have on that <laughs> would be great. <laughs> well, if it's siblings, then, then the whole family should get involved with some kind of mm -hmm. like reward system and praising, I mean, praising the child who will actually try it so that yeah. the child who's not trying it will see that. Um, yeah. and, it, and it's just, it's the same thing about giving the empowerment to them and focusing on the positives of what they're doing. That's right. So that hopefully yeah. with that empowerment, they'll be more willing to try it. And then if the other child chooses not to, then they're just not, it's not that they're saying, well, you're not doing that, but you, they're just not getting all of the positive attention that the uh, that child that's willing to do it is. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, I know that does make sense. But focus on what you want to see. Focus on the... Well, right. You need to get, you need behavior. To get that positive attention. <laughs> yeah. The positive yeah. Attention. Right. Um, Instead of the negative. Right. And help them get something that they want by doing what, you know, instead of putting, giving them the power and the contingency instead of um, having them get what they want with, with getting the bad attention because that they're also not eating because the other child isn't or whatever. Yeah. You know, because that child is not eating. Why are they not eating? Are they right. escaping? Is there like, what's the reasoning? So um, it's giving everyone a chance to find their own empowerment so that they want to even just try. Yeah, that makes sense. So, so focus on encouraging, po like positive. Yeah. So, so they give somebody, if, if your kid is doing that and you think that that's why they're doing it, don't give them attention for that. Right. Don't. Okay. Don't like, even though it's negative, don't give them even the negative. Would you say rather just like either ignore that, like pretend they're not doing that or like, if you can't find a positive way, like if, or do you, how, sorry, <laughs> hopefully no, I'm making okay. sense. Yeah. So like the kid who will throw the food off the mm -hmm. plate instead of mm -hmm. being like, what, why'd you do that? Um, have it be, have it be like, even as simple as, oh, good job. You sat there for 10 seconds without, um, or with making good choices. And then that's, that's how they get the, the, the attention is trying to find something like the teeniest something, something that, that you're focusing on something good they did and not okay. what they did that's bad. Okay. So it's not like you're focused saying, you know, okay, good job on, you could say instead like, well, you ate all your other food. Thanks for trying that. Or you could, so you can just completely ignore the, the I won't eat this type of food. Right. And, and say, Oh, you tried this food. I'm so proud of you. Right. Is that right? Okay. Gotcha. Right. Or if they'll at least, like I said, smell it or, you know, just hold it. it. Some kids can just, just even holding it is hard for them. So, mm -hmm. but if you don't know that, then you could say, okay, just pick it up. That's all you have to do. And then put it down. Good job for, you know, being adventurous and trying and, and holding it for us. 
And like, that's the end of it, you know, but not like, okay, now, like you can try to get them to go to the next level of, okay, now smell it, you know, awesome. See how, you know, whatever. So you can, and then if they say no, then say, well, good job, you know, good job for, for being in touch with that. Right. For at least trying it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And trying, I mean, obviously you don't want kids throwing stuff and you don't want kids, you know, throwing a fit, but it's like, you have to try to find something on the positive end. And then eventually behaviors can change that way through positive reinforcement, just like instead of negative reinforcement. Yeah. You know, it's much more pleasant for everybody. I feel like (laughs) it may be harder at first for mom or dad or whoever caretaker, but I feel like overall it's probably faster in the long run than negative reinforcement. And it's also more enjoyable. (laughs) than all the stress and the yelling or whatever else you might try. I know that's easy to slip into that, but yeah, um, I think positive reinforcement is great, great tool. I have another viewer question. And then if you don't mind, I'll ask you a couple other <laughs> questions. Um, so a viewer wrote in Marlene from uh, Arizona. She said that um, she has a child w- w- with autism who um, she said he basically has no hunger button that uh, she c- can't she wants to know how to get him outside of his comfort zone and she said that he he tends to like completely smooth like sm- just completely pureed smooth um foods and that she didn't worry as much when he was younger but he's now nine and she's wanting to help him grow i guess he's having trouble um with growing and he's he's into sports and things like that and she's she's really worried about his nutrition so she was just wondering how can she help him to be more adventurous when he doesn't even seem to care whether he wants, he eats anyway. And he's got such a limited diet. So if you have any advice with that, and that's real specific, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I'm sure maybe, a lot of people are in that, that same boat. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it could come down to finding something that he's interested in, like, like sports and then finding mm-hmm. um, things that like the sports guys are eating or having oh. that him watch something that like they're doing and then being open to, well, he's a, you know, he's a professional sports guy and he's eating this, which shows that, you know, just trying to get it where it's more about um, like being open to trying it because obviously if you want to do good in sports, you need to have the nutrition um, and trying to get it where he's, or, you know, have him help make something or have him watch something that, again, it has. To, it's probably going to have to be related to something he likes so that he's more willing to do it for that reason, not because mm-hmm. of the nutrition factor or because of the hunger factor. Um, yeah. And then maybe with the teams and stuff, maybe he's more willing to try the, um, as the goal instead of what doesn't motivate him, which is trying new foods. There yeah. has to be a way to motivate him to have new foods, whether he chooses to or not if he doesn't have a hunger trigger that makes sense yeah yeah there's no he doesn't get hungry enough to so yeah so you got to find something else (laughs) that makes it worth his time right (laughs) right so you can say you know let's have two bites of this whatever and then you can go oh no my battery's gonna die on my computer oh oh, it's okay Uh, (laughs) you know two bites of this and then um and then you can go out and play with your friends and like that's all the expectation is i have to walk into another room so hold on a minute I was gonna say, if it's nice, <laughs> sorry. Come with me for a second. Yeah, the the camera sure does suck up a, a lot of computer juice. <laughs> yeah, sorry. No, it's okay. Um, yeah, so the other night when we go oh, ahead. No. Um, it's about finding the motivation and using that. Yeah, is what I can say. Sorry, I'm at my clinic. No, it's okay. We get a tour of the office. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, I love your painting in the background. That's beautiful. <laughs> the flowers. <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> so my son. What's that? No, I said this is one of my little therapy oh, rooms. Gotcha. Uh, my my oldest, um, I always have more eating issues with him. He uh, is the one who's on the spectrum. And when he was younger, um, he he was talking and then he stopped talking. Um, and that's when we started with early intervention. Um, and so, uh, they told us that he needed feeding speech therapy and I'd never heard of such a thing. So I was going to say, if you wanted to share more about like what that is too, um, I'm sure that there's other people like me who 
I have no idea such a thing exists, but they had said, you know, fine motor skills were around his mouth with the issue. So we ended up um, having like little exercising, like holding his chin and stuff while we were feeding him and lots of bubbles <laughs> and, you know, blowing stuff with a straw and everything. But um, I don't know if you have anything on that to share. Um, and then there's a couple other things that we went through that I figured I'd bring up. Um, but he, he ended up at one point, he also um, would only eat the edges of foods. So I don't know if that was, you know, like <laughs> what part that was, but he would eat the edges of food. So like we would chop foods into smaller shapes. <laughs> So right. he would get more surface area. Right. I mean, eventually that just left on his own. Um, we never worked on that with, you know, AB or anything like that. It just that eventually he stopped. Like one time it was adorable. He had a cookie with sprinkles and he ate the whole edge around the, the cookie. And he just sat and stared at it for like five minutes because he wanted the sprinkles. But he didn't want to eat more than the edge. And he finally scraped off <laughs> the sprinkles. But I guess sometimes you just kind of sit and wait it out. Um, but he, he started with a really limited diet. And we... Um, I'm curious if, if this is the right way or the wrong way. So that way people can learn from my lessons and I don't recommend it. Um, but we had an ABA therapist tell us, you know, he won't starve himself, which I know, like you said, that's a myth, um, you know, not necessarily. Um, she told me, she said, he'll get a lot closer to starving himself uh, than other average kids probably. But she said, chances are he won't. Um, so what we did is we started offering the food and we, we did like the no pressure thing. And we... Part of how we did it was, so I feel like this is maybe not as motivating, not as motivating, but my family, when we grew up, sorry if I'm rambling, um, but my family, when we grew up, they, they, they always pushed, you have to eat everything on your plate, everything. And my sister and I have said that both, we struggle now with overeating because we always feel like we're wasting food. Cause that's what we were told is that we were wasting food and starving kids could have it somewhere. So we've always said that, um, you know, we understand like the idea behind it, but it's, it's caused this lifelong problem where we want it with, even when we're full, we feel like, but there's still food there. And we have to constantly think of that and be like, okay, but I can save it for later or I don't have to eat it. Or, you know, I can go with smaller portions. Like, so it's something that we struggle with. Um, we don't want to have our kids have the same issues. So what we always, what I have started doing is um, for most of their lives is I offer them the food. I say, this is what we made. You don't have to eat any of it if you don't like it. Um, you don't have to eat any of it if you're not hungry. Like I let them decide at what point they're done. But I do also try to use kind of like natural consequences with them and just say, but if you're not hungry, you're not hungry. So like there is no dessert or their food afterwards. You know, it's just like it's here if you want to eat it. And it's not, is that an okay approach to take. I mean, because it ended up working for us. Like my, yeah. my son did, um, he's a very adventurous eater now, like eats all kinds of stuff. And I never in a million years thought that would be the case. And I think the first month was really hard for all of us, <laughs> but, but we never pushed him to eat anything, but we never, you know, just let him just skip it and go on to the next thing that he liked. Is that? No, that's like either, exactly, yeah, that's what you should do because otherwise they're going to, they're going to hold out for that. Yeah other thing because they'll know nice if I don't eat, I'm going to get yeah if I don't eat I know I'm going to get that because mom's going to be worried that I'm not going to eat anything and so she'll offer me that yeah because so that's where it was you know like at the beginning it was like well he'll only eat these foods so you know I would try to hold out and then at like the end of the day I'd be like here here's chicken nuggets like because you know you do worry about your kids yeah but and it was I think it was harder on me probably the first day or two of trying that than it was on him, <laughs> but it, right. but it has paid off. So it has been worth it. It was really only a few days that it was really kind of hard. Um, but we would like keep the food, you know, if I, if he said he was done, I'd let him know. Um, and we still to this day use that though. I'll, I'll say, if you're done, that's fine. Just remember you're making a choice that you're done. And so they say, I know. Um, and then I'll say, and I'm, I'm going to set it up here. And if you change your mind later and you are hungry, then it's still here. And that's until the next meal time. What we say is that until the next meal time, if you're hungry, this is your food, <laughs> but we don't ever push it. Okay. So, so that's not, not a bad recommendation then. No, okay. No. Okay. I mean, say, if, it, it, if it is something new, it, like I said, it could be a small teeny, teeny amount. Right. That's and we do that with the, with new foods. I give them just a little bit and we have a try it rule. So if it's a new thing or something they don't love, like we do do Brussels sprouts. And so I'll tell them, you know, I'll give you two or three. And if you just eat one half or whatever, then that doesn't count towards the, no dessert rule because you just have to like eat a bite <laughs> or try a bite is what we do, you know, because right. mine are good eaters. So, so we just kind of put it there, but yeah. Okay. So, yeah. so that's why the one way you can do it. And then two, like the, the try it 
like you were saying, so that's another way to help is just small bits. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any advice with like, um, or if you want to tell more about speech feeding, feeding or anything, or anything else you want to say before we wrap up? So, I mean, I work with infants that are having trouble breastfeeding and it mm -hmm. all comes down to from infancy to, you know, an adult, um, if there's oral motor weakness, then they just can't, they don't know what to do. So, you know, babies that don't know how to breastfeed well, if they, if they go straight to a bottle, <coughs> sorry, they're not going to be, they're still going to go to food now with weak muscles because a bottle doesn't support the same sucking pattern that a, bo that a bottle does. So um, they're not going to have all the muscle strengthening they could have if they would have done breastfeeding. Now, I didn't breastfeed my kids very long because I couldn't, but um, but I'm a speech therapist, so I made sure my kids have, you know, strong mouths. But a lot of it's about just getting them exposure and um, working like you can do a, like a there's like a baby vibrating toothbrush that you can use on kids mm -hmm. to like wake up their mouths and vibration is actually um can help build muscle. Um, depending on how old they are, you could make, you know, do games where you have them like do resistance, like, you know, and pushing in or, you know, making silly faces and having their tongue go back and forth, you know, or um, like the ooh, 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 ee, 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 like monkey faces and different things to just kind of get the muscles going. Um, straw drinking um, is really, as a really good muscle um, trainer. If you, especially if you could do something that's a little thicker, it promotes a base, like a, a retraction of the tongue or blowing bubbles. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I'm working with little guys all, you know, that are having oral weaknesses and that's why they're delayed on speech and they're delayed on their feeding. Um, so trying to work with the tongue muscles and the cheek muscles and the lip muscles to get them stronger so that their speech and development improve. And I, I do look at airway to see if there's a constriction and that could be why those mouth open, the open mouth posture, the kids, there's a weakness yeah. there and there could be an airway issue there. So, um, cause a, nor a, a, a de normally developing kid doesn't have that open mouth posture. So that's a sign that there's something not right. Um, yeah. It doesn't mean that they're not normal developing. It just means that medically there's something that has to be addressed. Um, if so you don't, they, don't get to the foundation. Right. Yeah. Then. <laughs> Right. So, I mean, and I a lot of parents come in with their kids at three and four and they have that open mouth posture and they never even realized that. Um, so if you have an open mouth posture and you sleep, you're not getting good um, airway and it can cause um, things like ADHD type symptoms during the day wow. because okay. your brain's not getting a full rest and recuperation because you should breathe through your nose for filtration and CO2. So if your wow. mouth's open... Wow your tongue is back and you're going to have sleep apnea or snoring type symptoms and your brain isn't able to rest because it's chronically trying to like wake up so that you don't have an issue. And then they appear with those ADHD type um, behaviors in the day because they haven't been able to rest. So there's just so many aspects. Yeah. To yeah. That's, that's remarkable. remarkable. That's, crazy. that's crazy. So, so do doctors, I mean, is that one of the things as far as like having the open, open mouth posture, you called it, um, do doctors not know as much about that? Like, do they not notice it and see that and say something? Or like, are they not trained for that? Or do they not see a child long enough in a checkup, do you think? Like, is that something that if a parent is seeing it, they should take, like, who should they go to or to, to, to so I end up With those open mouth posture kids, I end up sending them to an ENT okay. or an ENT consult. Um, because a lot of times if they have that hyponasality and like they chronically sound like they have a cold, or, um, or they have an open mouth or, and I'll say, do you do this? Your kid snore? Does he have sleep apnea? I mean, if they have those symptoms, there's somewhere that there's an airway constriction. And so an ENT would look at that and diagnose it. Depending on the age of the kid, you could also take them to a orthodontic or dentist that has a 3D cone head topography. So it's an x-ray that goes around their head and back and it can show airway where their airway is. If there is a constriction where it is, so you can't mm -hmm. see if your adenoids are enlarged. You can just hear it. Um, but this topography would show that. So wow. those are the two places I tend to send those kids that I see. Because doctors know a lot about a lot of things, but they don't know yeah. a lot about, like, specific you know, systems. Thing. Right. Yeah. So yeah. Um, I, that's just kind of where my training is. So I say, you know, the whole kid. And I know, like, this part of the kid. 
you know? Yeah, yeah. So I'm trying to get them more trained and more aware to look at that stuff, but I have a long ways to go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, we're glad that, so glad people like you uh, choose to do what you do. I know that like, with my son having lost his words um, and he was nonverbal for a while, um, he was kind of real severe on the spectrum and he's, and he's kind of 180 with a lot of intervention. He's He's been very fortunate, but every so often I just cry when I think about, like I know that you guys work super hard. You go through a ridiculous amount of education and training and you know, the hours are long and I know that the pay doesn't always uh, <laughs> reflect what it should. So I just on behalf of everybody else, um, I, thank you for what you chose to do and because it's a choice nobody's making you do it and you continue to do it so thank you and thank you for taking time to talk to us about it too i really appreciate it so much <laughs> so is there anything else anything you want to say any main points to wrap up or anything because otherwise i think we're coming up on our time and i'll let no, you get to your weekend <laughs> the, the big thing is just to look at why try to figure out the why um i think if you can figure out the why it'll help guide you on where to go um, yeah. And if you don't know the why, then go, you know, get a get a speech therapy like a feeding eval or an occupational therapy eval and see if they can figure out the why, um, because there's a reason. And it could just be if it's a food jag, that's temporary. If it's a, um, you know, like if it's something, it's some, every kid does something for a little bit. It's when it gets extended that that's when it becomes the problem. And if you don't address it, they're not going to grow out of it. So it has to be addressed if it's more than a little length of time. Um, and it, so, sorry to interrupt, but yeah. before we move on real quickly, how, what would you call like length of time or is that subjective depending on the kid? Like any guidance on that or, sorry. To <laughs> no, I mean, I honestly don't know. I would say um, a couple months. Okay. I mean, it kind of depends on what developmental stage they're in to know okay. what. Oh, like. I see. I would say, so like a food jag where a kid only wants peanut butter and jelly. If that mm -hmm. lasts more than two months with exposure to other foods, then I would say just go in and see what, if you can get guidance on, you know, what else they can do to kind of alter that. Or maybe there's, yeah. there's a reason why, or, yeah. you know, so um, a few months, but it, again, it depends on the age of the kid and what that, what that delay is from or what it um what it is that they're stuck on okay that makes sense yeah totally okay. yeah okay so, so that, I, yeah that's, that's it really is it just it's so complicated so it's just yeah. figuring out the why the why um, and being staying positive right positive yes. and low pressure yeah staying positive low pressure talking about um giving them the empowerment and having it be an adventure and um all of those things are are going to help the kid relax into the situation instead of feeling pressured and because no one wants to do anything when they're pressured. Yeah. I, I feel like if you just put yourself in their shoes and imagine so if somebody's making you do something, you're probably not going to want to do it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. Well, thank you so much for joining us. I'm going to go ahead and um, click you off and, and let you get to your weekend and I'll wrap up our, our podcast. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you sticking with us and giving it another shot. You're welcome. Have a good weekend. You too. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Okay, you guys. So next week, um, which is coming up soon here <laughs> because of the glitch. Sorry about that. Next week, Sped Homeschool Conversations is not going to be um, broadcasting. So this is kind of, I guess, fill in the gap here in the middle. But uh, it's the 4th of July holiday. So we're not going to be broadcasting. We figure um, everybody's going to be enjoying uh, time off with their families. But July 10th, uh, we will be back, and it will not be me, and hopefully no more of the glitches. So sorry about that. But Peggy Ployhar is going to be interviewing uh, Dr. – I'm sorry, Ms. Mrs. Beverly Burgess um, on the topic, Should I Homeschool My Child with Special Needs? And so um, if you are already homeschooling, um, then you probably know a lot of – great benefits, but you can maybe um, have a few more for the, the people that ask why and why should you and why do you. Um, it's always good to kind of like have a few more good reasons why that you can share. Um, if you're just considering homeschooling, this is also really great for you. And if you have friends that are kind of on the fence and thinking like, I don't know, you know, I don't know how you do it. I'm not sure if I should do it. Then this might be a really great podcast um, to, to share with them if you want to share it from the event page or even after it's done. Um, but until next time, until we come back on the 10th with that next uh, podcast um, and live interview, 
Help us keep our conversation going and reaching new people by commenting on our Facebook page posts, um, our Facebook. So in our Facebook group, we have that as well. Um, and also on our website, uh, spedhomeschool.com. When you engage on the Facebook posts, that helps other people to see them and helps you to be connected to other people like you and helps us to connect with you better as well. So um, let's see in the support group, I think uh, I can throw into the comments if you're not already there. And we just wanna thank the Learning Disabilities Foundation of America for funding part of the SPED Homeschool Conversations broadcast. And we ask that you prayerfully please consider uh, contributing to our outreach or supporting our outreach to um, reach special needs education, home, special education homeschooling families um, with a donation or you can even share um, fundraisers that we do. We do regular fundraising um, on Facebook and on our page, and you could always share that too. Um, it is a nonprofit, so everything is uh, run on donations. If you if you could just prayerfully consider that or prayerfully consider sharing that with others, that would be great. So for more information on how to make a tax-deductible contribution to SPED Homeschool, um, you can go to our website and just scroll down to the bottom there. All right, so that's it. Hopefully you learned something new. Hopefully you got some insight there. And I just, again, really want to thank uh, Kelly for joining us. Okay, you guys have a good night. Bye.